the promise of YouTube videos, which have been around for a while now, those five and ten minute videos you can watch on how to do stuff, like how to fix a clogged toilet, or perhaps how to braid a little girl's hair, or whatever it is, have, have given people a false sense of, I can do that, I can do it myself. In fact, we even call it that now, instead of saying do it yourself, people call it DIY, right? You can do it yourself. And so I admit I have watched plenty of DIY videos on how to fix things around my house or in my car or whatever, and it doesn't always go so great. Just because I watch a video on how to take apart the drain under the toilet if it's clogged or the sink if it's clogged doesn't mean I'm very good at putting it together again. And so last year when the shower broke and I thought, oh, I know how to fix this, go to the store, buy some parts, take the drain apart after watching the video, only to realize that the parts I bought don't fit. Time to call someone to come and fix it because I can't do it. I'm not a plumber. Go figure. Or maybe I saw another video and thought, oh, I can fix this broken fan in my car that's squeaking and making all this noise. I'll just do it myself. Only to find out that it's much harder than even the video made it look. And so I found myself phoning my father-in-law, who is, happens to be very good at fixing cars, going, if only he were here and he could fix it for me. Now, maybe you've never done that, made that mistake, but I'm guessing that uh, you have once in a while felt like you need to call in help because you can't do it yourself. You need someone who knows what they're doing, who actually understands these things and can, can make them work, whether it's whether it's some project in your house or your toilet, or maybe it's doing homework. Hey, I need some help with this. It's really hard. Or filling out your taxes when that time of the year rolls around. We need help. Who do we call? Well, in a spiritual sense, we also can feel this idea that we, we just wish we could call God like you call a plumber or you call your father-in-law, or you call somebody who knows what they're doing to come and fix the mess of this world and of our lives. Whether it's strains in your family relationships or your marriage, or, or broken friendships or relationships at work, could be that. Maybe it's just longing for God to do something to fix the general brokenness that we see around us in society, because it doesn't seem like the politicians are going to be able to do it. Who can we get to help? Who can we call on? God's people have, for thousands of years, been calling on him and saying, God, if you would just come and fix this mess and clean it up. And so in Isaiah 64, that's what we hear happening. The prophet Isaiah. And the people who he was serving are crying out to God, saying, come God, come and clean up the mess. Let's see exactly what it is, because when God comes, the hope is he can do something amazing, something that we ourselves can't do. So here we go. Starting at the very beginning of the text, it says this. If you want to follow along, it's in your service folder. If only you would tear the heavens open and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, just as fire kindles brushwood and fire boils water to make your name known to your enemies so that the nations would tremble at your presence. So as Isaiah is writing these words down for us, he is calling on God, God, Come down and clean up the mess that there is in this world. Now, in his day, the mess happened to be a specific threat that God's people faced from a specific nation called Assyria. Now, if you know anything about ancient history, 
the Assyrians are up there in terms of nations who did some pretty nasty stuff. They were known for being one of the most violent peoples to ever live. They didn't leave prisoners. They killed all kinds of people, nations that they invaded, and the rest that they didn't kill, they took them away from their homes in exile. And so when Isaiah is saying, come down, Lord, come down and fix this mess, he's thinking and the people are thinking about what God can do to restore peace for them and to clean up the mess that was caused by the fact that they were under threat from the Assyrians. By the fact that in one story, in Isaiah's life, the king of Assyria, a man named Sennacherib, surrounded their city, Jerusalem, with an army 185,000 men strong. God, what can you do about that? We don't have any way to clean up this mess with the Assyrians. Now here's what Isaiah's hope is, and it's our hope too. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. Now maybe Isaiah was thinking back. He's thinking back to all these stories from long ago like the ones that we read in the past few months. Like when God rescued his people, Noah and his family, in the ark. Or when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Or when he split the sea and the people walked through on dry ground. Or when God brought down fire from heaven. When Elijah was having a duel with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And you... He thinks of these stories, and Isaiah's like, God, if you could just come like that with your power again, that would be pretty great. You could clean up this mess, and everything would be good for us again. You and I, we, we haven't seen those things either. Fire coming down from heaven, God splitting the seas so that we can walk through on dry ground. But do you ever, in your heart of hearts, kind of wish for that, like, hey God, couldn't you come down and do some amazing things like we read in the Bible for us so we can see with our own eyes, so you can give us peace in this world again in the same way? I mean, it doesn't have to be like a huge thing, maybe just fix my broken drain, that would be pretty nice, or help me with my failing relationships, that would be good too. God, if you could come down in those small things, could you also come and heal my parent who's sick or who's my friend who's not doing well? Can you just come and fix what's wrong in this world? I know I've prayed prayers like that. I bet you have too. It's sort of the heart that cries out to God with words very similar to what Isaiah is saying, praying for him to come, and then wishing that he would. But then we have to remember the stories we have right before us here today, like even the story of Zechariah. Zechariah was waiting for God to come. That's how Luke introduced him. He was waiting for God to keep all his promises. But when the angel Gabriel actually showed up, well... <laughs> I think he kind of changed his mind. He didn't believe the angel's message that, that he and his wife were going to have a baby, John the Baptist, even as an elderly couple. And all of a sudden, Zachari or Zachariah found out when the angel, the angel said, you're not going to be able to talk, that actually the problem was him, was us. And this is, what I, this is the realization that Isaiah comes to. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? All of us have become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like a polluted 
garments or like filthy rags, Isaiah says. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities, our sins, carry us away like the wind. No one who calls on your name, striving to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us melt because of our sins, because of our iniquity. So as Isaiah and the people are crying out to God, saying, God, we just want you to come, then they have this realization. And it's the kind of realization you and I have when you realize, when I realize, the problem is actually us. That if you have to call the plumber to come and fix the mess that you made, the problem is not the plumbing. The problem is I'm not a good plumber. The problem Isaiah and the people realize is that our sins are the problem. We are the ones who made the mess. And when we call on God to come down and clean up the mess, maybe to, to get rid of injustice, maybe to clean up and get rid of evil in the world, then that means he's going to have to clean up and get rid of me and you. Because your sins and my sins are the reason why the Savior had to come in the first place. It is your sin that separates you from God, just as mine separates me from him as well. And so when Zechariah calls out, or when, excuse me, when Gabriel calls out Zechariah because he wouldn't believe, well, that's just one more sign of how we are the cause of the problem, why God has to come down in the first place. These, um, God calls our righteous acts, the good things we do, the best things that we can offer God, our DIY projects. He calls them filthy rags, dirty diapers, used feminine products is literally what he says in this text. That's kind of gross when you think about it. Sometimes the English translations smooth over the language, but it's, it's kind of R-rated in the Bible. And this is one of those places the language he's using to describe what we can offer God is so gross that we would just want nothing more than to get rid of it and to throw it away. Because when you're standing before a holy God, you realize we really have nothing that we can offer Him and our best is like garbage. The best that Isaiah could offer, the best that you can offer, the best that I can offer, isn't enough. And it's, it's actually a scary realization when you think about God coming, if that's the way that I am and you are. But that's not where the story ends. And that's not where Isaiah's hope ends. He has another thought, an important one. He says this, Yet, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Lord, do not be terribly angry or remember our sins, our iniquity forever. Please look, all of us are your people. Now, if you're doing a DIY project in your house and you mess up, you have every right, since it's your project, to start over, to make a change, to, to try to improve it, or just say, eh, I don't want to do this anymore and throw it out because it's yours. You can do that. And here in this text, Isaiah is saying, we are like God's DIY project. He calls God a potter, but he says, you are clay. God forms and makes people like clay pots. And as you think about that, thought is a little scary because if God doesn't like the way we turn out as a clay pot, well, toss it and throw it away. That's what people do with broken pottery. You can't really do much with it except throw it away. But here we have this promise, though, from God that he is not just going to throw you away like a broken piece of pottery because he's not just a potter, and we are not just his clay. 
We're not just his DIY project. God is also our Father. He has formed us and made us, yes. But he loves us and cherishes us as a father cares for his child, his children. And so when things don't go smoothly with us, like when parents have little children who make messes and have dirty diapers, we don't just say, well, I don't like this mess, so get rid of the kid too with the dirty diaper. No, they clean up the mess. They make it new again. They put a fresh diaper on that baby bum. And they clean up the house that is otherwise in the shape like a tornado went through because the little one was there. This is what God does. And how he does that is he literally becomes one with us. Jesus came down into this world, like I said to the children, wearing diapers as a baby at Christmas so that he could clean up the mess that we made. Now, in my house, when there is a mess to clean up, particularly a mess with toys, a, te a mess that, that the, the kids have made, and they say, we sing the clean up song, clean up, clean up, everybody, everywhere, clean up, clean up, everyone, everybody do your share. Do you think that the kids are always jumping up and down and say, oh, I'll clean up your mess too? No, it sometimes takes a little arm twisting, right? And when it comes for us to clean up our own mess, that's how we feel. We want, we want someone else to come in and do that. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He comes to clean up the mess of this world. The mess that you made and that I made. He's not afraid to roll up his sleeves and get dirty with us. Now there's a good story in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark that illustrates this. In the Gospel of Mark, uh, which is going to be the, the, the main gospel text that we use during the next year of worship, starting, starting kind of after Christmas, actually. Uh, Jesus appears to this man who had a disease called leprosy, which was a disease that made him feel unclean, so unclean that people actually would kick the people with that disease, leprosy, out of the village. They didn't want to catch it. And God, uh, Jesus comes, and he doesn't just say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my distance from you like you and I might keep our distance from somebody who's got a runny nose and is coughing. No, he goes right up to him and puts his arm on him and touches him. This is what the text says. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, though, was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man, I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and that man was clean. In a similar way, the whole point of Christmas is that Jesus has come down to clean up the mess that you made and that I made. To actually cleanse us of our sins, of our guilt of our shame, of our weaknesses. He takes all of that upon himself. He takes it to the cross so that God can look at you and see that you are squeaky clean, that in every way you are perfect and holy and that all that is bad about you has been washed away. When you get baptized, when the water is poured over you in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, that's what God does. He washes you and makes you clean. He says you are clean through the blood of Jesus. This is what it means for our Savior to actually come down into our world. There's this uh, TV show I, have, I heard about. I haven't, I haven't actually watched it before, but it's called Help, I Wrecked My House. It's about DIY projects that go terribly wrong. And so when people try to do something crazy to their house and they mess it up, they make it really bad, they, they call the people from this show and they're like, oh, we'll make a TV show about it. And they bring in professionals, the kind of people who can make a house that looks like a disaster or a dumpster fire 
into a show house that's so pretty on the inside that they want to they want to make a TV show about it. Spiritually, this is what Jesus does. He comes and he makes us into this kind of show house that you can show off to the world and say, "Look at how good things are." Because in God's eyes, God looks at you in Christ. And you're not just clean. You're holy and perfect and good. And all the things that you do are washed clean as well so that God sees your good acts, your good deeds made right in the blood of Jesus as well. So as we look forward to Christmas and cry out with Isaiah and all the people, Savior, Savior Jesus, who is the Savior of the nations, come. We have this hope this that one day when Jesus comes again, we are going to look just like this story describes, made clean, perfect in God's sight. And the whole world will see that is exactly how you are in Jesus. Amen. Please stand.